You're on. You're on, Arthur. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm assuming um, that there are people here watching us. Um, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. You may have seen for a second. He's officially on vacation, even though he may be lurking in the background. <laughs> um, I am Lily Browning. I am the uh, normally the co-host of this virtual plant clinic. Um, and today, Ed McMahon is filling in for Johnny Carson, and uh, we're going to have a great um, plant clinic. And I have invited my colleague, uh, Frank Galdo from Pasco County, has the sort of the same job I do in Pasco County. Why don't you tell them, um, Frank, about you and what you do there in Pasco? Yeah, well, glad to be here. And I'm the program, I'm one of the uh, Florida Friendly Landscaping Program coordinators here in Pasco County. Uh, so just like Lily's there in Hernando, I'm doing similar stuff down here in Pasco, making uh, whatever information is available to whoever needs it uh, to help them be a little bit more Florida friendly in their landscapes, whether it's new landscapes or existing ones, um, you know, plant selection, irrigation, the whole nine yards. So, and you have a yeah. concentration more on um, with builders and developers. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, I go wherever I'm needed. Uh, but okay. yeah, I've got a bit of a focus on trying to make sure that whatever's uh, being built currently uh, is as Florida friendly as possible from the get go so that we're not trying to come in after the fact and deal with problems that could have been prevented uh, if they were done right the first time. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's my, really... my dream. That's my yeah. dream is to have a you here in Hernando, someone who concentrates you know, specifically on all the new developments. Because that is an area that, you know, they just clear cut everything and then put whatever stock plants the builder can get a hold of. And you just have to, it would be better to do it right from the beginning is what I'm. It saves a lot of headaches uh, and a lot of, a lot of things can be done right at the beginning with plant selection and the irrigation design and all that sort of thing. And, you know, it's pretty much. Uh, smooth sailing if you if you get it right. So that's the goal. That's the goal. And good morning, Facebook user who's saying good morning to us. Um, Bill and I have our uh, suspicions as to who <laughs> Facebook user may be, unless we are completely wrong, but we think it's one of our friends who's a master gardener. If not, um, it's someone who comes to every one of these, and they are, you know we're glad for their input. So um, it's cold out. <laughs> I don't know if anyone has noticed that. But yeah, see, Frank's wearing his hat because it's cold out there. He's got a scarf, got a scarf <laughs> and everything. Okay. Good morning, Brenda. Yes, we are staying warm. Um, Frank is obviously, he had to go into the office this morning. <laughs> so you had to uh, get all dressed. The frost. <laughs> I'm still um, working from home. So as I just I just told Frank, I didn't really even look out the window till like around 830. And even then, I live on a Lime Rock Road, so it's white. And my first thoughts were, well, like, well, who widened the road? <laughs> it just looked so much whiter because everything was white. But yet, already at that point, my entire lawn wasn't white, just kind of in the swale near the street and everything. Um, We've had quite a bit of frosts and freezes this year. We've had pretty close to what I would call a real winter <laughs> here in Florida. Um, you're just a little bit further south, but you are inland, well, where your office is, correct? Correct. Yeah, Land Lakes here is typically a little bit cooler than where I have my house over in Newport Ritchie area. Uh, this was really one of the first ones over at my house where I got like a really solid frost across everything. There's been a little bit of patchy here and there uh, earlier in the winter, but this was the first one where pretty much the neighborhood kind of turned a little bit white this morning. Uh, and that's interesting but. that you say that because I bring this up all the time. I have people come to me and always with the line, but my friend in Newport Ritchie. But my friend in Newport Ritchie can grow Royal Pont Point Sienna, but my friend in you know Newport Ritchie can grow mangoes so much better. And you well, wouldn't... even within Newport Ritchie, there are so many little uh, micro uh, 
microclimates and differences depending on how close you are to the river or how close you are to the wetlands. Uh, you've got uh, a lot of heat sinks along there where those bodies of water trap a lot of heat and allow you to have like little pockets of warmer, uh, you know, frost-free areas. Uh, so even one side of the house versus the other. Uh, yes, yeah. Know, I, micro I game those microclimates as much as I possibly can. Right. But you're kind of 9B there, correct? And yes. we're, still, we're still 9A up here. Yeah. And, it, you know, it, it varies all across the county. So I don't know really what's left. Um, where I am in northwestern Hernando County, it... Um, it seems to get, you know, a lot of frosts hit by the frost quite a bit. So I don't know what's left to worry about getting frosted <laughs> or, you know, because a lot of our things have already, um, you know, right. been if, pretty bit. If it was going to go, it was going to go and it's probably already gone. Yes, um, I have. I Bill and I talk a lot about the queen palms, worrying, not worrying, but, you know, uh, prophesying, I guess, that those um, are really the wrong plant in the wrong place up here, and they're eventually going to suffer for it. Now, you can have it 15, 20 years without it being too cold for the queen palms. And if it's an adult one, it'll probably do okay. So I don't know if anybody's baby queen palms have suffered. I've been looking a little bit. I do go out, and I have not noticed trouble with queen palms yet. That may show up later. But what I have seen are... Robolini's just fried. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, they look kind of like somebody took a blowtorch to them. Yes. So, what do you, if somebody here has a Robolini palm, small one? Oh, 24 in Denellen. That's what Sid Taylor, my friend, is telling us <laughs> this morning. Oh, wow. I think um, it was 29, is what my phone said when I woke up this morning. I do know. My two little co-workers here, who are like eight and nine pounds each, they <laughs> ran outside and immediately back inside when <laughs> when they were done this morning. Their paws on the uh, frost. There's um, big oh, differences yeah. across here. We've got 22 up in Ocala and frozen bird baths. And then Pinellas, we had oh, wow. uh, Cindy checking in a little bit ago saying no frost whatsoever down there in Pinellas. But yeah. That kind of makes sense. Uh, it does, well, yeah. Peninsula so surrounded you, by water there. If somebody has a Robolini, um, what's the other name for the Robolinis? They have another name. Um, <laughs> anyway, those little... Like you have three or four of them that come up, little palms, the Robolini palms. Um, what do you what do you suggest, Frank? People do if they have one that is fried. Um. Well, for right now, you probably want to leave it alone, do nothing, because any of those leaves that are still remaining on there are going to help insulate it from the next rounds of cold weather. Um, and then, kind of longer term. Uh, you know, see how it starts to recover or not recover once we start to get some spring weather. You know, the, the typical stuff like uh, Lily had mentioned in some of her recent programs about cold damage plants and things like that. Um, you know, kind of refrain from going all crazy with fertilizer or anything, like trying to kick new growth out, just let it Right. Oh, no, no, yeah, don't do yeah. that. <laughs> um, but it's ultimately... Great. It is going to be one of those things where, you know, it may be a decision of, is this a plant that I want to continue to baby and have look like this year after year or every other year, or every couple of years? Um, you know, it's it's a right plant, right place kind of thing. Pygmy date palm is the, the, the oh, they're, helping me, they're helping me out. <laughs> um, um, lady palms. Um, I don't know if you're suggesting that's the name or you're asking how they would do. I think they would probably be okay in the colder weather, wouldn't they? As far as I know. They, I mean, I kind of put them in the same line almost as like a palmetto, you know. Mm -hmm. um, not sure. But if any palm at all of yours looks like it's damaged in any way or any plant, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. There you go. Um, or any plant at all. All we can do right now is wait. 
it's a wait and see. Don't prune them. And believe me, all through the rest of February, when it feels beautiful and sunny and spring-like, I mean, tie your hands behind your back. That's what I have to do because you're going to want to prune all that ugly stuff away. But the way this winter has been acting, I think we're going to have more cold stamps. I don't think this is the last one. So what you find out there, Frank? All right. You know, so in the Bible there. <laughs> Lady Palm is listed in the Florida Friendly Landscaping uh, Plant Selection Guide as Zone 9 uh, tolerant. So given that they're listing it all the way up through Zone 9, I would say you're probably all right. Uh, usually... Uh, you know, the ones that really don't like the cold, they're going to list them in there as zone 10 or below. Above. No, yeah. The bigger, the taller palms, even if they look pretty dead, um, people are telling us from Hillsborough and Pinellas that they're just fine down there, which stands to reason, you know, with their palms. But up here and in Ocala and Citrus County and, and all the cold pockets, which if you, well, our... Um, news broadcasting really only reaches to Hernando. Sometimes it goes up to Citrus. But have you ever noticed that Brooksville is the coldest spot in the, every time, <laughs> except in the summer, might be the hottest, <laughs> but if you, I mean, watch the news tonight. You Those cold see. air masses just kind of sink and travel right down that little. I think what happens point. is um, their um, thermometer is at our airport. And our airport is in a very kind of low cold spot, or kind of near the um, Suncoast Parkway. And then just across from it on the Suncoast Parkway is Anderson Snow Park, which I know and my daughter knows she has to spend a lot more time than I do there, that it's the coldest place on earth. <laughs> when you have to watch kids uh, play softball or soccer or something. See, I can come and go as I please. I'm grandma. She has to sit there. So it's, it's it's a very just the way the wind blows across that flat area or something. Right, right. So. You know, that reminds me. Probably one of the other things that benefits things like lady palms is, um, you know, that's a palm that's not going to necessarily be planted out in an area where it's full exposed. You know, full yeah. sun, wide open wind, and all that kind of stuff. And just that shelter of some tree canopy, some surrounding plants and things like that is actually one of those things that can make a surprising amount of difference between whether or not you get a frost or a hard freeze or things like that. Um, those little differences of just a little bit of canopy coverage and surrounding plants um, actually <laughs> help to insulate a lot more than people realize. Well, let me uh, share, let me see if I am successful at sharing well, wait a minute. I think um, Bill once told me I had to have it up already. So let me. There you are. Okay. Um, share screen. Share screen. So while you're working on pulling that up, uh, one funny thing, you know, a, a while back we were talking about mistletoe in our uh, Christmas program where we did yeah. some guest hosting. And just the other day with that crazy wild wind that we had a huge amount of mistletoe came blowing out of the oak tree in our parking lot here oh wow and uh, a little bit back, late for christmas but. right looking back through my photos from last year around this time uh there was actually a windy day in the first week of february where the same thing happened the mistletoe came down so it's oh, like so it's, it, it's mistletoe week Right. Yeah, we get <laughs> yeah. apparently a wild February uh, cold front that whips through and knocks down a bunch of mistletoe. So uh, there you this go. picture, um, Bill and I did a program for the Native Plant Society on Monday evening, and they wanted to know about cold protection. So here's a picture that um, I use a lot just because I think this demonstrates one of the um, most ideal ways. Of course, these are small plants. And I love those little tents. <laughs> I don't know if they're made specifically for plant covering. Um, the one thing I noticed only just this morning, though, is this is used, this home is using rock as a mulch. So that might be actually detrimental to what they're trying to accomplish here. 
what we try to tell people is when you are covering plants, what you're trying, you're not trying to like Frank and I both have sweaters on because our bodies can generate heat. Plants cannot. That's not what we're trying to accomplish. We're not trying to wrap up a puppy who is cold. <laughs> no matter how you wrap up um, the plant, it's not going to work. What you are trying to do is capture some of that radiant heat from the ground because we don't have permafrost and that ground is going to stay maybe 48 at the coldest. So you're, the most ideal situation is you create a tent around the plant that captures that radiant heat from the ground without ever touching the plant. That's the best case scenario, not always possible. Um, so this is just showing, so, you know, boxes great work great for small plants. And we all have a, uh, you know, multitude of boxes now that we're relying on Amazon for life. So, and we also have, um, in this picture, don't tell our recycling coordinator, Carmen Bruno, that someone here has used three recycling uh, box <laughs> to protect their plant. As long as you use it again for recycling, that should be fine. And the other thing I wanted to show was this one. And a lot of people, they think if they wrap up the foliage that they're protecting the plant and they're absolutely not accomplishing anything at all <laughs> that way. So that was really what, what is, what I wanted to show is that we are trying to capture that heat from the ground, um, not wrap up our plant, like, you know, to keep it warm. I will say last year I had a couple of cherry tomato plants that made it through the entire winter and kept producing well into early spring uh, because every time some cold weather came through, uh, I took some large extra trash cans that I had, like, you know, the big oh, yeah. black trash cans and just upside down and over the whole tomato cage and everything they went. And I had the tomatoes kind of pruned and contained in a way that the trash cans could just lift right over. Your uh, recycling bucket reminded me of it. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, that was a great idea too. Generally, um, if you have to use a cloth and drape it over, um, use cloth. That's, that's the word, I, you know, they make frost cloth. Um, you can use a sheet blanket as long as the blanket isn't too heavy for the plant that you put it on um you want to avoid plastic sheeting like a tarp or anything like that because that tr transfers the cold quicker back to the plant worth noting in the picture that you put up there that it looked like there was something helping to weigh down those cardboard oh, boxes yes, yes. because otherwise you know on a cold still night like what we just had last night that would work fine to just set a box over it uh but if it was like you know the night we had a couple nights ago where the wind is whipping through like uh you know the polar vortex is upon us <laughs> yeah you know, your cardboard may wind up in your neighbor's uh you know queen palm tree <laughs> whatever same thing for any kind of cloth um it has to touch the ground because that's what you're trying to do, capture that heat. It doesn't have to be 75 degrees in there. It has to be 33 degrees <laughs> in there, unless it's you know a more tropical, so maybe 45, 46, something like that. Um, so even a cloth, you wanna put rocks down or something so it stays touching the ground. Creating lollipops out of our trees and our plants they do that like with crepe myrtles, which I don't even know why, because crepe myrtles aren't going to suffer from the cold, <laughs> you know, but I've seen that done and it's not accomplishing anything or they just wrap up shrubs, not all the way to the ground. The other thing is now that we're, what is it now out there? It is here in the Royal Highlands. Oh, my phone isn't wanting to tell me. <laughs> 54 degrees already. So, what I see done is I go out and I take walks and people, they just get tired of covering, uncovering, covering, uncovering. So they leave them covered. Not a great plan, is that, Frank? Yeah, it kind of depends what your weather is going to do for the day. But yeah, often you're going to want to try to get that stuff off. Uh, sometimes it's, it's a little tricky. Like, you know, I had to try to weigh the odds of all right if i'm leaving at eight o'clock and there's still frost everywhere right uh, and i gotta get to work uh, yeah that's what i was thinking uncover 
it is very difficult for working people who have to leave the house. I was mm -hmm. thinking of that because um, um, Bill had mentioned in the class we were in that, you know, you want to water before a freeze event, but a good, you know, hours, hours before the freeze event occurs. Well, sometimes you may not even be aware of it, and then you get home after dark, you know, <laughs> that's kind of too late. Usually that's taken care of, though, because many, 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 many times, what precedes a cold front in our area? Rain. So, yeah, nature takes care of that for us, so we don't have to worry about watering it. Why would you want to water it? Because the wet soil radiates the heat even more. But you don't want to do that at 10 o'clock at night <laughs> and create icicles around, you know, the, uh, the ground there. So, if you have covered up, goal. I'm sorry, what was that? I was saying it depends on your goals. Maybe some people like icicles. Yeah, oh, now that we've said that. Okay, I'm with water conservation. Are you aware of that, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, right, right. <laughs> now that we have said that, there may be people out there who think they want to emulate what the farmers do. Uh, do you want to? You want to touch that one? Um, I mean, long story short, you shouldn't. Oh, yeah. uh, it's probably not the the right approach to do in a residential setting. Um, well, what farmers, they do. Yeah, go ahead. Um, they're pretty much running water continuously, uh, especially when like a hard freeze is predicted where the, the weather's really going to get down and they've already got fruit or flowers on the plant. And they literally encase the plant in a layer of ice in some cases. And the melting ice takes that cold rather than the plant itself. It's kind of a bizarre little scheme of physics. Uh, but yeah, essentially you can, in some cases, prevent the whole thing from freezing just because of the temperature of the water staying you know, up. In some cases, you actually encase it in ice, but then continually melt the ice, and the melting of the ice actually gives off heat because of physics. Uh, you know, it's not a strategy you really want to do for a residential setting. You're probably no, not going to be able to run your sprinklers that long, and if you do, no, you're not, and it may not be your day to run them. So you got to consider, you know, the fine you might get. Also, just you know, it's a waste of water. But what happens with your irrigation system is it puts on zone one for 45 minutes or whatever that turns off, it's going to go to zone two. And what would happen as soon as that turns off, everything turns to that 32 degrees and you've just killed everything. What the farmers do is have constantly running water. That's why you see them on the news, all bleary eyed and their hair all over the place and they're like I've been up all night and you know making sure the sprinklers don't turn off or die and it is just not um, something that is recommended for homeowners you're not going to be able to accomplish it with your irrigation system and you're not going to be allowed <laughs> to run your irrigation system all night long and they're doing that because they're trying to protect you know a crop that was, you know, that's their year's salary there. You know, you doing it, your water bill might, will definitely rise. You might get a fine and, you know, what is your landscape plants worth to you? And as Bill pointed out also in that class we taught, people get overexcited trying to protect shrubs and things that are going to be just fine through the cold, you know. So if we don't have any questions coming in, I wanted to bounce an idea off of you that, um, oh, actually, now that it looks like we do have a question coming in. Have you seen rain gutter hydroponic plastic planting systems? That's a question for Frank. Um, I am not specifically familiar with that, although I think I know what you're referring to. It essentially looks like a rain gutter uh, and it's kind of a flow through hydroponic thing. Um, I'm not familiar with them and I'm not sure if UF has anything specifically addressing that system. Uh, Is it coming off of the roof would be my question. I'm not a fan of um, edible uh, products and roof water. 
I don't know that it specifically is actually using roof rainwater as opposed to just looking like a gutter. I, I, I would have to get a little more clarification on that one. I don't know. Sorry. Okay, someone has a dandelion in Broward County. That's interesting. <laughs> I didn't know dandelions grew that far south. Yeah. Yeah, I'm guessing this is one of the plants that looks similar enough to dandelion. It, it you know, for Florida purposes, gets called a dandelion. It, um, yeah, it has Jim Mall told you about um, the DYC classifications? Right, right. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, that's a horticulture joke. We'll just leave it there. The the second two words are yellow composite. <laughs> we won't say what the first word is on this when they're trying to ID some of these plants. Yes. But yeah, we have things like the uh, Asian false hawksbeard that pop up this time of year and are flowering all over my yard. Tiny little yellow flower on top of a little basil rosette. Yeah. And they do actually make the thing the, the seed heads that you can blow. And yeah, all sorts of stuff like that. So I, I think regardless of the specific species, you know, it's it's one of those sort of things where an ounce of prevention is going to be your best opportunity that by the time they've already popped up and are flowering, they're they're already there. But you have the opportunity to head it off a little bit from next year if you manage it and try to reduce the amount of seeds that it's able to create. So you're gonna to wanna to try to catch them before they flower and go to seed. And at a minimum, be mowing them short enough so that they're not producing that seed or actually hand pulling if you've got a small enough amount. Uh, and then next year, what you're gonna to wanna to do is um, kind of keep in mind that these are annual plants that have an annual life cycle and they will be back next uh you know january or february and the year after that and the year after that and there are preventative uh weed products that deal with the germinating weed seeds uh, and prevent them from becoming the problem um, so there's there's products that we would call a pre-emergent herbicide uh, so depending on your feeling on herbicides not everybody is interested in using them but they can be effective when put down at the right time of year at preventing some of those annual weeds from getting that start uh, and, and yeah. being able to take off. Spring, spring's going to come to Broward County a lot sooner than up here, too. So you have to try yeah. and catch yeah. them. Me, personally, I just let the weeds be in the yard. <laughs> I like having a, what we call um, one of the agents came up with the name of Freedom Lawn, uh, or also a diverse lawn area that attracts um, pollinators and you know, things like that. But you may live in a community that does not allow, you know, that, you know, your neighbors kind of come by and freak out if you have one weed. So, yeah. Well, you know, and and, and some of them like that, uh, you know, Asian pulse hawksbeard or the bane of my existence is dry Maria in my yard. Um, you know, some of them, they, if you've got a small amount this year, will become a larger amount next year and a larger amount. And, uh, they kind of exponentially exponentially eat the world and invade your veggie gardens and other places. So it, yeah. it's kind of a matter of goals and all that sort of thing. So, yeah. um, are you seeing what Carl was saying about his um, system there? The um, yeah, I'm, I'm not very familiar. Okay, self-contained, not a running water system. You know, that's one that I would have to look up a little bit and try to learn a little bit more about. Okay. Yeah. And well, at the end, you can put your email if you want to contact you then. Julia cannot keep basil plants. They do not thrive in any location for her. What are the desired conditions for basil? I haven't had much luck with herbs either. I need to keep trying. <laughs> but Okay. So, you know, Julia says here that she can grow the purple basil, the purple Thai basil, and she's on to something there with that, which is that there is a specific disease that basil has been affected by over the past several years uh, called downy mildew. And it's pretty devastating to cultivated basil, uh, especially your sweet basil, your traditional Italian basil. Uh, and your best strategy is 
going to be plant selection, getting the varieties that have proven tolerance or resistance to downy mildew. And there's some information. If you search UF downy mildew, uh, you will actually come up, uh, UF downy mildew and basil, you'll come up with a, a few pages that talk about it a little bit. Uh, they don't necessarily list every variety that's resistant, but I have personally found, uh, and the UF trials have found, some of the purple varieties are more resistant. Some of the Thai varieties are more resistant. There is a sweet basil variety now on the market uh, that I believe you have had some uh, some assistance in the production of, but I could be wrong. Um, but it's called Amazel Basil. That's the cultivar name. Uh, so Amazel Basil is the one that's going to look most like your traditional Italian basil with the large green leaves, uh, but it's got much better resistance. Uh, but yeah, in general, basil likes to have some nice, even, consistent moisture. It likes to have um, you know, not the world's most intense all day sun. It wants a little bit of a pause. So morning sun or some afternoon sun doesn't like to have the leaves stay and dry too long. So I especially like to have it get morning sun to dry those leaves in the morning right away, get the dew off and everything, and then give it an afternoon rest from the intense sun so that it's not overheating and cooking, um, the roots, especially that. If you're growing it in pots, one of the things that I see often uh, people having problems with is they'll have their pots sitting there completely exposed to the sun. And if you ever put your hand on the side of a pot, especially those black nursery pots mm -hmm. in the middle of a hot sunny day when the sun's beating down. Um, you can you feel know, it before you touch it. Yeah, the side of those pots can get incredibly hot. You're basically roasting the roots and the plants will get really stressed out. And a lot of times that's when you're especially going to start to notice that the mealy bugs come in and the, the different uh, pests start to affect them and things like that. So um, keep the roots cool, keep the top dry, try to keep your moisture even and pick a resistant variety to downy mildew. Do some testing, uh, try to figure out what works well for you. I've had good luck with um, some of the darkest of the purple basils like purple ruffles and um, one of the purple opal kind of varieties, um, some of the Thai basils, the amazel. Um, Genevieve basil uh, comment just came in. More power to you if you can keep it going and it's happy. Um, I don't remember that one specifically unless it's a, a specific cultivar. Um, I don't remember that one being listed as one of the more resistant varieties, but you know, it may be somewhere in the middle. Um, we have conversations going on about the dandelions and that is just dandelions are always one of those um like target topics yeah, somebody says the word and then you always have your people who love them and your people who don't love them so much so it, it is all a matter of what you want you know for your yard and the um only weeds i worry about in my yard are sand spurs and i just when i when they are producing the sand spurs is when I can tell them apart because a grass is a grass to me. Um, I pull them up. That's, you know, what I do and try to stay ahead of those. Those and fire ants are the only kind of treatments I really do in my yard. I don't live in a deed restricted community, so I don't have anybody after me to have the perfect looking yard. I'd rather have an alive yard, <laughs> you know, with lots of cool things going on there my neighbors might feel differently but and um dandelions are just one of those topics or any kind of pretty um darn yellow composites we'll call them that um <laughs> that uh you know people like in their yards bees do love them so you know uh, sand spurs are one of those ones uh that you know managing them this year can help you next year and uh, on down the line you can actually make headway if you do it, it does yeah because they, they tend to yeah grow in like little clumpy areas so i get those and i yeah, pull them out the only up, problem follow it back to that base and then yeah. yank the whole thing out make sure the only problem all... i have now is i need to figure out some sort of system in which to dispose of them um that's not something i want in my compost pile or anything and apparently just throwing them in the uh bag of trash in the yard 
in the yard, in the uh, garage, has not been a good idea because I have been yelled at <laughs> by, by the person picking up that bag of trash. <laughs> so um, he wasn't happy with that. So I need to maybe put him in a container <laughs> and put them yeah. in the trash or something. Contractor bag. If, yeah, if there you go. Got, got a contractor bag that you dedicate towards that kind of stuff. It'll take a while to fill it. Um, yeah, yeah, that's how true. Much you got, but, <laughs> but yeah. It keeps those prickles a little more contained. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the kitchen trash bag didn't work out well in his opinion. <laughs> yeah, no fun. Oh, yes. Yes, someone digs out, puts them in a bag, and takes them to the dump. Yep, that's oh, kind of what we making do. Sure they get out of there. Yes, yes, that's what I do with the sand spurs. Many other types of weeds, I might just compost them. Or because I'm not a, I don't think weeds are the enemy. <laughs> you know, it depends on the kind of weed. Frank and I have talked a lot about um, Spanish needle. <laughs> that yeah. is, I have such a love-hate relationship with it. It's found its way into my front bed, frozen now, of course. <laughs> um, but when it starts growing, you know, the, the hate part of the relationship is because it wants to take over everything. And if you have it near where you or your dogs or something are going to walk, it's going to put those uh, hitchhikers and stuff all over you. The love part is you go out there and it's just loaded with every kind of pollinator you can find. So I can't, you know, really bring myself to say, no, you can't be here. Yeah. Oh, somebody. <laughs> I, I certainly, I've got some in my yard. I manage it and it probably more than any other plant in my yard, um, you know, in terms of it needing intensive management. Uh, that's one of those where like I keep it around because of the pollinator benefits and because the little rabbit that lives in my yard right now likes to munch on the Bidens um, and our pet rabbits also like to munch on it. Huh. Uh, but, but yeah, the... Uh, the management of it to control the seeds and control the spread and everything. Uh, it's, it's probably one of the most labor intensive plants in my yard, but I do keep some of it around uh, in kind of like a, a back corner. It's interesting that you say that about the rabbits because I went to pull it out of my bed, even though, you know, in general, you need to wait till about March 15th or so to really start cleaning up um, all the dead looking stuff. But this is Spanish needle. It's a weed. So I was going to clean it out of there. And I got it cleaned out of one spot. And then I went to move to the other. And I'm really glad I didn't just, you know, like get my lawnmower out there and try to mow it all down. Because a bunny hopped away from in where I was. And I realized, oh, she's got a nest in there. And she was using it as, even though it was all dead, you know, as, as cover and hiding. So... That part of the dead looking um, Spanish needle, Biden's alba, is still there because the bunny is using it. <laughs> well, and that brings up an interesting topic that I've been thinking a lot about lately, which is the concept of sort of right plant, right place extending to. Uh, kind of front yard plants and backyard plants and the kind of things that um, you're okay with just kind of leaving and looking pretty scraggly and looking pretty rough once they freeze versus the areas where you might, you know, it might pain you to look at it looking sad uh, mm -hmm. for several months. And, you know, it's something that I've semi-consciously and semi just like, um, you know, by good luck, done a little bit in my yard and I've been noticing it more and more. So in the backyard, in this back corner, I've got this uh, big patch of Bidens and scorpion tail and tropical salvia. And it's created like this pretty impressive little, um, you know, thicket hedge almost. And there's rabbits living in there. And it's kind of like, it, it's its own little microclimate. And in some ways, it's actually kind of protecting itself from the frost and whatnot. Um, but, you know, if it starts looking rough because of the freeze, it's right next to the the uh, fire bush that looks a little rough from the freeze, it's okay because it's in the back. It's kind of serving a wildlife purpose. It's serving pollinator purposes, but I can leave it 
And, you know, I can leave it untouched until springtime when it's the appropriate time to go in and thin it out, let it reseed and all that. Whereas up in the front yard, I've got things like my Yopan holly, which is basically freeze proof and loaded with red berries and just looks beautiful in the winter. I've got my muley grass and it's just kind of this full crown of feathers right now. I'm just going to leave that alone until it's time for it to start flushing out again. Um, And, you know, strategically using those front yard plants, backyard plants and kind of working that side of of the angle. Um, I have a question here about orchid plants that I purchased and the blooms last a long time. But what should I do to get the plants to bloom again? Depends on what kind of orchid. There's about a million types of orchids. I assume she's talking about like the ones you can get from Lowe's or something like that. Uh, I'm not sure what you can do. <laughs> Orchids are a specialty unto themselves. This is the problem when you ask the Florida-friendly landscaping folks uh, uh. about orchids, which you know in this part of Florida are are typically indoor. Uh, you know, yeah. maybe on the lanai, bring them outside sometimes, but they're not grown full times outdoors. So us landscape folks, we uh, we kind of think of them as oh, you know, that's the uh, house plants. But we do have a master gardener who is an expert on orchids. His name is Gary Gethin. So if you email Dr. Lester at W Lester or call, there you go. Thank you. Or call that phone number and you'll get Teresa and um, ask her, uh, you know, say you have this orchid question. And if she can't find the answer, she'll contact Gary, who has given classes on orchids. Orchids are one of those things kind of like roses and things like if you love orchids, like that's your whole life (laughs) is orchids. So he knows a whole lot about that, how to get them reblooming, things like that. So. You don't want to hear my approach to orchids. Uh, it tends to be uh, utter neglect and things like forgetting about them on a, a kitchen table uh, while I was traveling in a Ziploc bag with a couple paper towels and finding them months later and just being like, oh, hey. <laughs> and, you know, lo and behold, I managed to get that thing to rebloom multiple times, but. Um, well, there yeah. you go. So if they bloom again, it's a miracle. A lot of times what happens in horticulture is life finds a way. <laughs> That's I um, had some, oh, what are they, you know, the frangy panty. Um, I had them out over this summer that would make the lay flowers and stuff. And um, plumeria, thank you. <laughs> There's so many different names for some of these plants. Um I, they have been given to me and you know what you can do with them is, you know, take the stalks and just put them in the garage. Well, somebody just gave me the stalks. I hadn't even potted them yet. I found them. I don't know how many years later <laughs> in the garage. <laughs> and I thought, well, let's see what happens. And I put them in pots with soil and they didn't bring, give me any flowers last summer, but they did leaf out. And now they're back in the garage, but still in the soil. So they're going to have some roots and things. That's the kind of things you can like shut in the dark all winter long. And they're going to come right back. So, uh, I saw a question, something about, um, something about an HOA. Where was from Cindy Shore? Thank you. The man behind the curtain is running these um, uh, comments here for us. <laughs> so, I live in an HOA. Landscapers maintain the lawn. I was told the mowers contaminate lawn to lawn and park to park, which makes sense. One neighbor has fleas. I believe when they use the blower to clean up, they blow them all over. The HOA said the rabbits have the fleas. I have heard, you know, it is when I've heard about, um, you know, lawn companies that they they should be cleaning their blades from place to place. A lot of times they don't have time and don't do that. And what they are usually transferring from place to place to place would be diseases. Um, 
such as take all root rot, you know, the, the fungal spores and stuff from that. I have never heard of them transporting fleas, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. What do you think about that, Frank? I mean, it's a little outside my wheelhouse. It feels like if there's fleas next door, then, you know, it's it's not out of the question that fleas could be just moving along on their own on the squirrels or the wildlife. Uh, yeah, all the wildlife have fleas. Be, yes. uh, you know, of course the rabbits it, have It doesn't fleas. necessarily yeah. need a, a human powered vector like a blower. Uh, you know, that could potentially help move it or the workers, you know, walking around. But, you know, there's squirrels and birds and things like that traveling all around. So I think the I'm not exactly sure if this is asking for advice or anything, but it sounds like maybe the, the real issue is trying to work with the neighbor to address the fleas issue. Um, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure where to take that one. I'm not either. Um, and there are some things you can do um, to help with fleas in your yard. Um, maybe Brenda on here, maybe she has some ideas because and um, they have all sorts of issues and mites and things like that. She was saying that her chickens love to eat the Spanish needle when we were talking <laughs> about the Spanish needle, too. Um, you know, there are treatments you can do for fleas in your yard. Now, there's always going to be wildlife, and that is what where the fleas are going to be attracted to their blood meal. They don't care about what's in the lawn. So... It's almost good that the wildlife is there <laughs> to take that up. So, you know, but you put, you have your dog go out, then, you know, you might have a problem then with them jumping on your dog, but that's when you have to treat the animal, you know, make sure you give them their treatments so that, that repel the fleas. Now, can and it could tie, be. Tying together two different comments that I saw, because right before the fleas comment, I noticed for just a split second, there was a comment about milkweed and making sure that it was not treated with pesticides. Um, interesting thing that I was reading about a while ago that not a lot of people connect the dots on is the types of treatments that are put onto pets to treat for things like fleas are actually essentially systemic pesticides. They are designed to kill on contact, be long lasting and things like that. And they can spread back from the pet to your hands when you pet the uh, dog and cat and things like that. Some folks actually, um, you know, actively take a role in raising their butterflies, you know, moving caterpillars from plant to plant and things like that. It's really important to remember that if you have pets that have flea treatment on them, you potentially are a vector for systemic pesticides. So even if you have non-treated milkweed plants, if you're petting your dog and then touching your milkweed plants and taking cuttings, or you're picking up caterpillars from one place to another, um, you could potentially be, um, you know, being a transmission of pesticide between one thing and another. So I always try to remind folks of that, uh, you know, personally, I don't do the, um, you know, actively raising caterpillars. I create the habitat and kind of let the whole thing happen out in the, in the yard. And that way I'm not actively getting involved in uh, yeah. the personal business of each and every bug, um, <laughs> but some people do. And just uh, the two comments juxtaposed, juxtaposed, uh, mm -hmm. Made me think I had that. never thought about that, you know, and butterflies are extremely sensitive to yes. pesticides. And I'm, I'm with you. I create the habitat and there are people out there who, you know, they want to save the superstars of the pollinator world because they're pretty. <laughs> and then they get, you know, really upset if something attacks the butterflies like wasps and things like that. And I think we take a more natural approach. You create the habitat and then let, you know, nature do its thing. And that means some butterflies aren't going to make it and some caterpillars are going to be food. Well, that could be part of, you know, their purpose in life. And actually creating butterflies is a great idea because you're going creating butterflies. Gar butterfly gardens is a great idea because you're going to attract any other kind of pollinators. 
they love all kinds of flowers. What I recently, you know, learned though is our superstars are butterflies. They're beautiful, have them. They're not the most efficient pollinators there are out there. They don't like to be messy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, you know, they've evolved to create that long proboscis to suck out the nectar. They don't get it all over them. They're not all fuzzy like bumblebees. And also they are non-particular about what they nectar on. So they're going to go from this flower to that kind of flower to that kind of flower. Whereas some of your more selective pollinators, which might not be as pretty or as cute, they may even be beetles or flies or something. They're going to go to the same flower each time and actually accomplish that pollinating. Really good key point in terms of uh, gardening for wildlife and pollinators and all that kind of stuff. Definitely. Um, the idea that, you know, butterflies have a really big role in creating a whole lot of high calorie, high protein snacks for a lot of critters. Feeding People don't birds, like to hear that. They, yes. They don't like to hear it, but there's, there's a direct correlation between the panic of, oh my gosh, my caterpillars ate all the milkweed again or they ate all the parsley, what do I do? And the fact that, um, you know, not every caterpillar is actually supposed to make it all the way to the end goal of butterfly. A lot of them are destined to become a snack for something else. Uh, and that's the reason why so many are born. For critters like, you know, sea turtles and butterflies and all these different things that lay a ton of eggs and very few survive, generally, um, you know, there's a reason. There, the whole system was kind of designed around that concept that a lot of them are going to become food for something else along the way. And then a few that have the best uh, luck and skills and camouflage and defense mechanisms and all that, they're the ones that make it through. So. But don't, yeah, but don't worry, your monarchs um, develop, they eat that um, milkweed, which makes them poisonous, so they don't get eaten as much. They have kind of evolved that way. Um, she liked what you talked about with front yard plants and backyard plants. Can you elaborate more on native or Florida-friendly plants that are better for the front versus the backyard? I'm working to develop a beautiful front yard that inspires others and keeps neighbors happy, but is Florida-friendly and Florida native. I have a class coming up. Um, let me see when it is. That, well, next week I'm having Living Florida Friendly in a Deed Restricted Community, which might be of interest to you. And then on the 17th, Native Plants for Formal Landscapes. Hey. So, <laughs> so um, yes. So if you go to Hernando FFL Programs, Facebook page. You'll see on the events, I have a class at 10 o'clock every Wednesday. Um, if you can't make it then, it does get recorded and put on the uh, Facebook page. If you don't like Facebook, thank you. Thank you, wizard in the background. Um, there's my email right there. And um, they also will appear on Hernando County Government YouTube channel if you don't like Facebook. So, um, I'm going to be covering that, but I'll let Frank talk about, well, you talked about those Dayhoon hollies would look good in the front for that more formal look, the muley grass. And while you said that, I know you have a pet peeve about muley grass, so I'll let you talk about that as well. All right. Um, yeah, I think to, to first kind of talk about things that I would look for in front yard plants, I would look for things that are going to uh, – be pretty bulletproof in terms of their freeze and frost tolerance. So if something's got a reputation for uh, getting nipped back and kind of looking rough as soon as it gets a freeze or a frost, um, you know, unless you live south of that freeze line, you know, those would be plants that if you want to have them in your yard, they've got wildlife value and things like that. Uh, I personally keep those towards the back. And that way, up front, I've got things that I know are going to look uh, pretty good and sparkly all year round. Or if they are going to get hit back, you know, it's going to be in a way that it can be kind of hidden and tucked back behind stuff and whatnot. But yeah, things like, you know, Kuntis, 
depending on where you're at, where they just have a beautiful natural form. They don't need a whole lot of pruning. They just kind of, uh, you know, they have a, a space that they take up and they're structural. They've got that really nice sort of structural foliage kind of thing going on. Um, that's a lot of what I look for. Things with uh, nice, tight, compact leaves or a nice uh, structural form. I think I find some inspiration for that kind of stuff with, uh, you know, both looking around landscapes and gardens around me, uh, but also looking towards things like uh, different garden designs, Japanese garden designs, where you're looking at things that don't tend to have a lot of uh, turf focus, don't tend to have a lot of flower focus, because a lot of flowering plants are going to look good sometimes, bad sometimes. Um, you know, use those as accents and kind of focus on your form of your plants and, and things like that. But I don't want to steal too much of your thunder from uh, what you're talking about. Oh, no, 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 because I don't know yet. <laughs> uh, that's two weeks away. I haven't made that class yet. Um. Uh, there you go. <laughs> but yeah, in terms of the pet peeve about muley grass, uh, it is uh, regarding the timing of the pruning. I believe that's probably the one you're talking about. That, yeah, your, your, um, root, your root cleaner. <laughs> Yeah, too often muley grass gets chopped back at the wrong times of year. And when you do that, you wind up with something sitting in your landscape that looks like you could be uh, scraping mud off your boots on it. And it's just going to sit there looking like that uh, until the next round of new growth really flushes out. New growth is going to typically flush out uh, really well in like early spring through summer. And so if you need to divide it, if you need to chop it back, uh, you know, wait until the end of all these cold snaps. So, you know, end of February, maybe. And do it then. In the meantime, leave it as a nice arch of uh, feathery tufts like that. It's going to provide shelter for wildlife. You're going to have different things that are able to nest in there and kind of use that as a nice insulated blanket. And it's just going to sway in the breeze and look nice. Uh, if you chop it back now, I've seen some in professionally managed landscapes, uh, they get chopped back right now. And typically what you have is it looks like a boot brush and then you have like one or two little green spikes that are going to pop out here and there until it really starts pushing out new growth in earnest in another month or two. And in the meantime, those little tufts that stick up, they're going to be cold sensitive. They're going to look just weird. Um, you know, and it really doesn't even need that on an annual basis. Um, you know, in Never general, <laughs> yeah, you can kind of, you know, trim it back, shape it up a little bit, uh, lift and divide it once in a while if you need to. In general, if you're having to chop it back that much, a lot of times what it means is you have planted it too close to a walkway or a curb or something like that. I see this a lot in commercial landscapes, uh, you know, out in the parking lots and things like that. It'll be planted right next to the curb. And people are like opening their door into it and it gets just stomped on. And that's a matter of wrong plant, wrong place. You know, it's growing really well. It's growing too well for the spot. Um, Kuntis are another one that I see like that. If you're going to plant a Kunti, keep in mind that the mature size of a Kunti is about, you know, three, four, five feet across a lot of times. They can take a while to get there. And often because of the, the size and the cost of them, when they're planted, you know, they're about this big. Right. Um, but yeah, right plant, right place means give it room to get that full crown of foliage so that you get that nice hemisphere of just uh, beautiful growth on it. And then leave that until it's time to get the next one. Um, yeah. Valerie pointed out that um, when we were talking about what lawnmowers can spread around as weeds is definitely um, what they can spread around. And even with, her within her own um, property, she cleans it off when she goes from place to place, like from her formal yard out into the pasture, you know, and cleaning the tires, all that. So you're not spreading that around. It's hard to get the company to do that. They have a certain amount of um, houses they have to get done in a day. And if you, you know, want them to clean their mowers between each house, they should be, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are. So there is, you know, um, you know, lawn spread to diseases, <laughs> you know, lawn transmitted diseases and weeds and stuff that get spread around because you're all using the same mower decks and everything. 
Um, Bill, could you show again that flea control um, publication? If you're still around there, <laughs> there we go. Uh, you don't have to try and write down that whole link there. Just look up getting rid of fleas and put UF for University of Florida after that. And you should be able to come across this information for you as well from the University of Florida. We're wrapping up on almost an hour, but um, something I wanted to make sure that you um, walk away from this uh, being aware of is that we are encouraging you not to prune anything yet. As I mentioned earlier, February is going to feel like spring and it's going to everything inside of you is going to want to prune away all the ugly stuff. But we have we've had a pretty good winter and what I describe as winter what happens here in Florida is we have three day winters and then we have a break of a week or two. Then we have another three day winter. <laughs> we have a break of a week or two. In those breaks, you're going to, it's not going to feel like winter and you're going to want to pretty up your yard. There we, used to be we a were time. Joking, we were joking the other day, winter, spring, summer, and fall. Yes. Know, February's got them all. <laughs> yes. Um, and, you know, with years that I've been working with the county extension office, we used to be able to tell people, absolutely, March 15th, that's it. That's the end. That's our last frost. And then in the past, I'd say, 10 years, that all went to heck. And we've had frosts on April 1st, you know, or freezes. So you can use March 15th as a general guideline. But in the meantime, that ugly stuff, that dried up, frozen stuff, is doing a job. It does do, um, it's protecting some wildlife, as Frank mentioned. But also, when we do have another, what could happen is in those warm phases, the plant itself is going to react and start to grow new growth. Then we'll have another three-day winter. <laughs> so all that old dead stuff actually protects that new growth, you know, and um, it's doing a job there, believe it or not. So I tell people we have to learn to live with the ugly until it's time to trim it away. If you just can't stand it, and I have been guilty of that from time to time, know you're taking the risk. That's all that I'm, <laughs> you know. That's what I'm saying there. So we're not out of the winter yet. That's what, that's my point. Indeed. Yes. And there's my email. Um, Frank, can you, are you able to write? in the comments, put your email there. Let's see what we got here. I'll put the easy one. Um, F Galdo. But F Galdo at UFL.edu. I have a Pasco County email as well, but that's uh, quite a bit more. Bill of a hates my like Fernando a, email. <laughs> yeah, mine is uh, Pasco County FL.net at the end of it. So yeah, I'll just yeah. give you the UFL one and that works. Okay. Well, okay. always a pleasure to be here. And yes, you know, thank you I, so very much for joining us today. Yeah. Um, I seem to join you on the, the cold weather days. I, you I do. We had a yes. cold day in the fall program yes. that we did and a cold day yeah. for the seasonal color one we did back around the holidays. We're not fair weather friends. We are cold weather friends, apparently. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. But hopefully you'll join me for a class in March. Um, I mean, if you can, you know, put some time aside for that, <laughs> one of my March classes. And it should be pretty warm then. But maybe if we have a class that'll um, guarantee that we're going to have a cold front that day. I don't know. <laughs> there you go. We'll bring the last <laughs> frost. Yes. Kind of like reverse Groundhog Day or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All righty. I think that is... Um, I think we tried to cover everything anyway, and we need to let the man behind the curtain actually have his vacation time, <laughs> though he's been secretly uh, producing this program, I guess we should say. Thank you, everyone, and um, Bill will be back next week. Same time, same channel. I should be here, too. I'm sorry um, I missed the last two weeks, um, but I, you know, I know Bill handled it fantastically because... He's a really smart dude, just like Frank is. So, 
Well, and thank you, always, everyone. It's always a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, enjoy winter, spring, summer, fall, whatever the uh, the winter. upcoming week and weekend might bring. <laughs> All right, thank you, everyone. And Bill, I guess you can turn us off. <laughs> and we'll see you all next week.